thank you to everyone for being here. It's great to see such a big group. We're really excited uh, to have four awesome accountants with us today um, to share some of their experiences and give some perspective about what opportunities there are in accounting. Uh, there are a lot of really uh, awesome paths and we've got a very diverse group of accountants here with us. Some might not even call themselves accountants still uh, and they're doing lots of different things in their job. So uh, I'm Matt Hogue and I'm the coordinator of accounting here at Gonzaga. Uh, my colleague, Dan, uh, is I think gonna be joining us and moderating most of the session, but I wanted to get the ball rolling uh, to introduce our panelists and to get this started uh, with a question uh, for everyone. So again, thanks for being here. Uh, we've got four panelists with us today. Uh, first of all, we've got John Hubertsey. He is partner at Alegria and Company uh, in Yakima. And next we've got Carly Kotsalovos, who is VP Director of SEC Reporting and Technical Accounting at Five Star Bank. We've got Jake Perry, who's manager with strategy and operations team at Deloitte Consulting. And last but certainly not least, we've got Riley Roach, who is an accountant with Lakeside Capital here, uh, not too far down the road. So thanks so much to our panelists. Uh, wanted to get the ball rolling with just a quick kind of warm up question for everyone. Uh, if you could maybe starting with John, uh, describe your career path uh, briefly, just kind of in a, a quick bio, you know, where you're at now and how you got there uh, to your current role, that would be awesome. Okay, I'll go as quick as I can anyway. Uh, my career path is kind of a testament to how much flexibility a career in accounting can afford one. Um, I started off uh, heading to law school straight after I graduated from Gonzaga with Matt and Andrew Brasich in what, 03, something like that. Um, got done with law school, came to Allegrian Company at that point in time with the understanding I was going to go practice law after my CPA hours, and I did that um, after a couple of years. I practiced law for about a year, and then meeting and marrying my now wife got in the way of that uh, plan at that point in time. Moved to Spokane, uh, worked at Moss Adams while my wife got her doctorate. Moved back to Yakima joined Allegri and Company and then uh, had an opportunity about seven years ago to join up with a couple of good friends and farm tree fruit here in Yakima. So I was one of the owners and uh, chief financial officer at uh, a couple of different families of tree fruit companies uh, until just recently when I rejoined Allegri and Company as a partner here uh, just a few weeks ago, actually. So that's my, that's my cliff notes. Hey, Matt, can I step in? Sorry, guys. I, I had some, <laughs> I, I came in and logged to my computer and it uh, completely died on me and, and took forever to get back up. So I don't know what happened there. So I apologize for being late, but it looks like you've got everybody started introducing. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm not sure who was up next. Sorry, You're probably next. Perfect. You're in good hands now with Dan. I'll just hang tight and mute myself. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Carly Kotsavalos. I know my Zoom says McPherson, just haven't changed my name on here yet. Um, I started my career with EY. Um, I interned between my grad year and um, I did the 3-2 program, the master's program. So I interned between um, those two years and then um, started full time with EY after I graduated in 2013. I spent the first eight years of my career um, with EY. I left as a senior manager and now I am the director of SEC reporting and technical accounting for Five Star Bank. Um, briefly, I'll touch on that. The difference is um, now I focus on reporting for the SEC from the client side of things instead of from the public accounting side of things. Um, and any technical accounting, uh, new accounting standards implementation. So right now we're working on leases and then CECL to come. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I think we're gonna hear from Jake next. Yep, hey everyone. Um, me and Carly go back, had several classes together when we were at Gonzaga around the same time. I graduated uh, in 2013 and between my junior and senior year, I had an audit and a tax internship with Deloitte and I am still with Deloitte, but my career kind of shows all over the spectrum and I'm not an accountant anymore, but shows that 
kind of an accounting background and a business background can provide a lot of flexibility in your career. So I spent two years with Deloitte in our Seattle office doing tax accounting and then got an opportunity to do a global rotation and spent three years with them in London, where I moved from strictly tax accounting to do a, doing a lot of pre-deal support and M&A tax work. And so I did that for three years with my wife and then decided to come back to the U.S. a few years ago, back to Seattle, but then I switched out of kind of the entire accounting tax side and I moved into our strategy and operations consulting practice at Deloitte. And so now I do pretty exclusively M&A strategy and uh, work with a lot of the tech companies in the area and on the West Coast, doing things from pre-deal screening and operational due diligence to post deal integration work. And uh, that just kind of goes to show that even though I've kind of moved outside of accounting, being a CPA and having kind of a pretty strong fundamental business background really gave me a lot of options to pivot and move abroad, come back, switch careers, and all the while stay with Deloitte the whole time. So thank you, Jacob. I think uh, we're ready to hear from, uh, from Riley. Awesome, thanks guys. Uh, my name is Riley. I uh, graduated from Gonzaga in 2017. Um, and unlike the rest of the three here on this panel, I uh, never never made my way to public accounting. Um, I uh, started as an undeclared business major at Gonzaga and with a little bit of direction from some other people decided that accounting was a good place to um, just start on the business side. And uh, I didn't really want to feel like I putting myself in a box um, by kind of going that public accounting route. So I had a pretty open mindset from the beginning um, and accounting should really be the opposite of putting yourself in a box because it just really opens a lot of opportunities. So I uh, started at Lakeside Capital Group um, just about a month after graduation back in 17. Uh, Lakeside Capital is here uh, in Spokane. We're a privately held investment company that uh, has a pretty unique asset base that touches a lot of different um, sectors. Uh, for the most part, we're primarily located here in the Pacific Northwest, and we touch land development, um, residential construction, aerospace manufacturing, petrochemical, um, agriculture, and several others. Um, I'm primarily right now uh, focused most of my time in the agricultural arm of Lakeside. Um, I started out here as uh, just an entry-level accountant. We were pretty lean on the accounting side, and I uh, kind of came in with two feet doing everything from AP, AR entry to fixed asset reconciliations, um, depreciation, and just kind of all that month end close process. But uh, recently I've moved into just kind of managing that ag arm, both on the accounting and operation side. Um, and uh, it's been fun uh, having an accounting background and really um, helping that pivot myself into more operations and kind of making uh long-term planning decisions and uh, working working on that side of things. So, so I think I'm here to give a little bit of a different perspective and it'll be good to hear from both the public and kind of that private side. Yeah, thank you, Riley. In fact, I, I don't know what I missed because I, again, my apologies for the computer crash, but I was gonna introduce the, the fact that uh, most of our graduates here in Gonzaga, they actually do start their careers in pub, public accounting. Of course, Riley mentioned that that's not where he started. Um, and then, of course, as you're seeing, some people stay in public accounting, but a lot of folks, most folks actually um, take a different take a different road. And so that's one of the purposes of today is to is to kind of see different career paths that are available to accounts. And, and just know we got great four great panelists here, but there are many more options out there in addition to these four. And we're just going to get a nice uh, kind of a glimpse at, at what's out there for accountants. So one of the next questions I'd love to ask and, and have you guys respond to is, and you've already addressed some of it maybe a little bit in your, in your introduction, but uh, feel free to add on to that. How has your accounting background or, or your CPA certification prepared you for the current role that you're in? Um, anyone wanna, how, how about if we start with uh, Carly, would you be willing to start in answering that question? Sure. Um, so like I said, I'm in a technical accounting role. So my CPA license and all the things that I learned at Gonzaga related to accounting are huge in my role. Um, I'm literally the person that, you know, everyone at my company comes to when it's time to implement a new accounting standard. Um, I'm writing the technical memos, doing the research, um, interacting with the folks at NASDAQ when we have reporting to file. Um, 
So really, I use that stuff every day. Um, and even before my time here at Five Star, when I worked at EY, I was on the audit side of things. So same thing, I used it every day because I was just on the other side auditing my clients um, who were implementing the standards and doing the accounting. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, how about Riley? How would you like to tackle that one? Yeah, um, I uh, originally kind of heading less in the public route, more in the private route. I actually uh, originally didn't think that I was going to go down and get my CPA. And then I realized quickly that um, having the credentials and being eligible to do it, it was a silly decision not to do that. So I sat for my CPA an hour or sorry, not an hour, a year after graduating. And uh, since then, I mean, I've just realized that uh, just being in the business world, I mean, having that accounting background as kind of your foundational understanding um, for making decisions on the operating level is really important. Um, literally every aspect of, of making decisions in one way or another is going to impact the financial statements. And the reason that the integrity of financial statements are, are there is to help you make decisions. And so I just think uh, having, having that CPA background and really being able to, to kind of see that um, in the decision-making process has been really awesome. And what's been unique is uh, being involved in multiple industries. You see uh, how accounting stays true across the different industry, industries, even though there are kind of those idiosyncrasies, you know, like being in the farming and agriculture world, a lot of that's still done on the cash basis, um, which is pretty interesting. And so you look at that and see how it translates to more residential construction and, and other entities. And it's really, it's really interesting to see the dynamics of accounting. And that's just been awesome. And, and, uh, and learning and continuing to learn. Thank you. Uh, how about you, Jacob? Yeah, um, in my current role, what's been really nice is having a CPA and, and accounting background it gives me a, a kind of toolkit that a lot of my colleagues don't currently have. As I mentioned, I've, I've pivoted outside of accounting and I work with a lot of folks that have a wide variety of backgrounds and a lot of them are MBAs. And then my current last few clients have been project management or product management on the tech side. And as a result, what I've found is I've been able to create kind of a niche and a pretty good uh, success rate at my clients by falling back on the accounting basics or the business fundamentals that I learned as a CPA. And a good example is one of my most recent projects. Uh, again, me not being technical, I work with a lot of folks that are computer engineers building kind of sophisticated products. And one of them, I was out at T-Mobile out here in Seattle. And as they're launching new cell phones and cell phone plans, they their intake process for how they decided how many phones do we launch a year? What markets do we take them to? Obviously highly technical discussions, but they had a very inefficient means of budgeting, tracking, tracking budgets, applying funding because it's a massive, massive organization. And so I was essentially the only one with core accounting skills on our team which I helped build kind of a robust process for them to save quite a bit of money and how they, one, take cell phone rate plans to market, but then also do that in conjunction. We were out there when T-Mobile purchased Sprint and we were facilitating their, the large merger of the two companies. And so even though, as I mentioned, it's not something I do day to day, it's a, a unique skill set that I have that a lot of my colleagues don't that have kind of made me a one valuable member of our team, but also giving me a lot of flexibility in what engagements or projects I get to work on, which also went into my ability to go abroad. It's, it's nice that when you're an accountant in a room with other folks that aren't, a lot of their skill sets may align and it's harder for them to differentiate themselves and an accounting background can be a pretty valuable differentiator. So it's been really, really valuable to me in my career. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, and finally, John, what would you like to add as far as the CPA and, and the accounting background, how it's affected and helped you in your career? Yeah, those are those are three really good answers. I'm not sure I'm going to be entirely additive to those. Um, and I guess some of it's self-evident with my uh, career path, having landed as a partner in a CPA firm, the accounting background and the CPA designation is obviously uh, very foundational there. Um, one of the things Riley said I want to echo if you are uh, set up and have the opportunity to take the CPA exam, even if you don't think you're going to go into public accounting, do it and do it as fast as you can uh, right after graduation. You're never going to have more time to do it than then. Um, and then um, uh, one of the things that uh, um, 
Jake was talking about, um, you know, being the person in the room that has uh, a fundamental and, and beyond fundamental understanding of accounting um, is really going to be kind of a ace up your sleeve in a whole lot of situations, even if you're in a room full of people that you think are, you know, decades more experienced and uh, more sophisticated than you are. Um, if you've got a if you've got a solid understanding of accounting, especially as it relates to whatever industry you find yourself in, um, it's going to give you a lot of opportunity to um, help move business forward and help uh, others understand your value. So, thank you. I, you know, as, as you guys were talking, I was thinking that uh, you know it seems like there's just a lot that accounting can bring to whatever you're doing, and and, and that CPA designation. Um, although obviously you need it for public accounting, it seems to be something that folks really like to like to see later on as well. I know here at Gonzaga, for example, I think when we hire for faculty, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Hoog, I think one of our requirements now is, is someone, if they do have a CPA a designation, that they maintain that license. And so we, we find that very important here as well uh, in the faculty realm. So it's something I think that uh, uh, a lot of industry and a lot of, uh, whether it's government industry or wherever, that CPA designation is huge. So thank you for sharing those, uh, those thoughts. Um, this next question I think is important because we know that the CPA exam is changing, kind of re relative to CPA. There's a trend among accountants towards specialization. And when I say the CPA exam is changing, there's, there's this idea of maybe having parts of the exam being kind of more specialized for what you want to pursue. So there's this trend of specialization out there in accounting. Uh, by function, by industry. In your industry, how is the accounting work you do, how is it um, specialized from other careers in accounting? Now, I know we've got public accountants. Uh, John, let's start with you. And then let's talk about some of the others as far as how the specialties have changed and, ha and how that you see that continuing to change. Yeah, so, um, you know, at our, at the CPA firm here, you know, we're a what almost everyone would call a small local firm. You know, we're, we're three different offices up and down central Washington. We're somewhere between 40 and 50 people, depending. Um, but even at that size, you know, we've got groups of our staff and, and uh, senior managers and partners that are focusing in, you know, a particular industry. Um, and it sounds like, um, you know, Riley and I, um, both have focuses in agriculture. Um, my background, having recently been CFO or a number of different uh, tree fruit companies here, is that's a very specialized um, industry, even within agriculture. Um, you know, apples, pears, cherries are what's known as a specialty crop, and we make up an infin infinitesimal uh, quantity of you know ag in the United States and globally. But it's an enormous part of what goes on in Central Washington. So. Um, having the industry knowledge and, and the specific accounting knowledge to communicate with banks, communicate with other stakeholders like Riley, because uh, private equity is flooding into tree fruit like nobody's business over the last decade. Um, it's, it's incredibly important, and, and I'm sure that's uh, to be found in lots of industries, not just ag. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, you, Riley, he, he mentioned you, so let's have you address that next in terms of specialization. Do you see that continuing or and, and how does that work in your career? Yeah, I think so. And uh, it's it's interesting just reading the question, uh, you know, specialization by industry and by function. And I think I guess what's been cool about about my career so far is that it's been pretty dynamic. And, uh, and I, ha at least early on, didn't really have any of that specialization because I was touching a lot of different things at once. Um, but you realize pretty quickly that, uh, like I kind of said earlier, and like John just said, I mean, just within industries, uh, even the, though the backbone of accounting is all the same, there are those things that you, you, know, you treat differently or a balance sheet in one industry might look a lot different than a balance sheet in another industry. Um, like our, our residential construction company, you know, the majority of that balance sheet sits in a WIP account and you're capitalizing costs uh, throughout the whole build process. And then um, you don't recognize any of that and change it until basically there's a sale of the home made. And uh, agriculture is another one of those where at least in the current farm that I um, manage, you know, you're, 
you're spending money 360 days out of the year and you're collecting money five days out of the year. And so just the, the accounting dynamic between that versus, uh, you know, a company that has recurring sales every month is going to look a lot different because those are costs, again, that you're going to carry on a balance sheet for 11 months. And then when you make the sale, you're going to move those off the balance sheet and actually run that through the PL. So, I mean, just as you, as you dive into the accounting world and the operating world, um, there are just those idiosyncrasies in accounting, but what's neat is that it all comes back collectively and it's all accounting at the end of the day. And so those principles that you learn in your 260 class and, and throughout uh, are just, are just uh, um, going to be ones that carry out and just looking at, uh, you know, professor law here. I mean, even cost accounting, a lot of that gets, uh, gets, um, or managerial, it gets, uh, utilized by some people a lot more than it does other people. But I tell you what, there is a world where cost accounting and managerial accounting is a big part of people's decision making process. So um, I would say don't don't write any of that off uh, or any of those other accounting classes like audit if you think you're going into the tax world because it shows up everywhere. So Hey, Riley, I appreciate the plug for cost managerial. Thank you. Uh, Heck yeah. Sometimes it's hard to get students excited about that because a lot of them aren't going right into public accounting. So appreciate yep. that. Plug. It's uh, important. Yeah, and John, I appreciate your comments too. I, uh, that's how I got my second job in public accounting was I was I, I had specialized in ag um, in the first job. And that's how they, they hired me up here in Washington for, you know, because of the ag specialization. So I, I saw that even you know, 20, 25 years ago. Jacob, what, what would you like to add? Yeah, I may be the worst person to give input on this specific topic, but the thing that I will add is myself, I actively fought specialization as long as I could because I always wanted to be a generalist of all trades and not get pigeonholed to any one thing, but it's inevitable and it doesn't have to be industry specific. It can be a wide variety of topics or subject matters that you become a specialist in. And for me, what that was is rather than a certain type of accounting. And as you'll have seen from my background, I started an audit intern, wasn't sure, tax intern, wasn't sure, hopped around it quite a bit. But uh, while I refused early on to specialize anything subject matter accounting specific, what I ended up specializing in was mergers and acquisitions. And so I say a generalist industry wise, and now I've moved a bit more specialized on, as I mentioned, tech and TMT side, but a uh, long roundabout way of saying that eventually you will either by proxy of, of your clients or the type of work you do, you will specialize in something and you can choose for the most part or try to emphasize that be a role specific, a subtopic of accounting specific or an industry spe specific or whatnot. Um, and so again, while I probably don't have the most accounting insights here, um, I think being a subject matter expert in something can be helpful, but maybe that doesn't make as much sense, but um, you will inevitably based on your experience be forced to specialize in something. And I, I don't know, I would, I would say keep your options open as, as much as possible. I appreciate you sharing that. I, you know, on that note, we, I, we do have a question um, and we're going to save student and, and participant questions mostly towards the end, but, this is related to this a little bit. So I'm gonna ask it real quick and, and this is open to anybody. Then we'll listen to Carly's answer in just a moment. But this is from Kevin Kulik and uh, do the big four currently have non-audit entry level tracks such as like the M&A diligence rules? Um, anyone wanna jump in with a, an answer to that as far as what you know before we have Carly answer? I believe they do, but what I've at least seen is that they're very heavily MBA specific focused. Um, it's a good good question that I, I will look into, but I joined the diligent role background or that role at Deloitte very non-traditionally through the accounting route. And so there's many avenues you can join the M&A side, but very good question. I, I will get back to you, Kevin, on that because I'm not quite sure if they only recruit out of MBA or not. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, Carly, I'll, let's hear your I'll thoughts. I'll jump in real quick. Oh, real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Especially uh, in systems role is where some of those entry level opportunities seem to be popping up more with the firm. So, MA would be, I think, much more MBA to get a direct path in. But if you've got accounting and MIS or accounting and analytics, 
they seem to be the, the, the larger firms and not just the big four, but probably your top 10 have consulting that would have a direct path in from undergrad. Uh, and so if, if that's something you're interested in, you know, public accounting has a very big consulting practice. In fact, I think for most firms, it's their highest growth area for, for new revenues. Um, systems and analytics seem to be uh, not just buzzwords, but, but certainly a, a good ticket to collect along the way as you're, as you're looking to get in uh, to that sort of role. Thank you. All right, Carly. Best for last, right? Let's hear your comments. <laughs> well, I think I'm gonna probably echo a lot of what the other panelists have already said because they had a lot of good points. Um, but you know, I do think that having a specialization can, you know, be helpful. It can get you really far in a specific niche. Um, I had a similar experience to Jake. Um, where I kind of had my hands on everything um, previously in my career when I was at EY. Um, now I'm more, obviously I work for a bank, um, so that's very specialized. Um, Riley said that, you know, balance sheets from different industries look very different. And for a bank, loans are on the asset side of things. So, you know, that was something that I had to get used to. And there's a bunch of other, you know, things that are very specific to banks that I didn't have Um experience with previously. So now I'm a little bit more specialized um, than I was before, though I would I will say that um, it's hard to know what you would be interested in specializing in until you've got that experience because you know early on in my career I had a lot of manufacturing clients. Um, and if you had asked me if I was interested in manufacturing when I started public accounting, I would have said, heck no. Um, but they turned out to be some of my favorite clients because they were doing um, percentage of completion contract accounting before um, 606 was a thing. Um, and so that was something that was super unique and none of my colleagues were doing or understood. Um, and it just got me some really awesome experience. So you know, even if you think that you might have a specialization in mind, I would encourage you to try a bunch of different things before you really decide. That's great advice. I've heard that from a lot of students. They've, and, and some students have been able to actually just move around to different, or some uh, uh, students when they graduate have been able to move from a number of different specializations and then kind of finally zone in on what they really want to do. So I've heard that from a lot of folks. This next question, and we're going to start with Riley on this one because I think it's important to start with him based on his background, but the next question is, what would you say to students who believe that the only way to be successful in accounting is through a career with a public accounting firm? Let's see, I'm not sure if we lost Riley there. Are you there, Riley? He's, he's frozen for a second, so. Carly, if you don't mind taking that question, uh, what would you say to a student if that if that was a question that they had about the only way to be successful was uh, in public accounting? Yeah, Just um, this is a hard question to answer, especially because I did start in public accounting uh, for so long. I do think it opens a lot of doors. Um, but I have friends who started in industry and, you know, they're doing some awesome things right now, or they've been able to pivot into maybe some other roles that aren't as accounting heavy, kind of like Jake has, um, and they're really happy in those roles. Um, I mean, I've seen every, from my graduating class, you know, we've got people doing everything. So you don't, you don't really need to, you don't need to do public accounting. It's just one option and it tends to open doors because, it is so common. Oh, thank you. Riley, we got you back. I'm glad to know I'm not the only one with technical difficulties uh, this afternoon. Did you hear the question um, that I asked? I did, yeah, sorry. I was having an internet, internet lag issue and I just had to do a quick little location change here. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I am obviously uh, um, one who I hear that question and I immediately, you know, look to people who think that the only route in accounting is that is going to that public route to start and just, you know, I'm not here to help because it's an excellent route. Um, there's no question, uh, you know, the majority of people leaving the Gonzaga accounting program go that route. And it's just a really good way to set you up and, and kind of pivot from there. Um, I knew early on, thankfully, with some guidance from some older siblings and just other other mentors in my life that that was a route I didn't want to go. 
And uh, the reason I went into uh, an accounting major at Gonzaga was not necessarily to end up in accounting. It just happened that way. But I mean, accounting just as a background just opens the doors to so many different job opportunities. Um, you know, you look at the other majors and or concentrations in the business administration major and, uh, you know, you look at finance and, and marketing and, uh, you know, a lot of those uh, have more of a kind of a closed door on where you can go. But accounting, uh, you know, not not to sound corny, but I'm just going to say it out loud. I mean, it is the language of business and I just think it translates in a lot of ways. So. I think um, even even if you end up just in a business route with that accounting background, you're always going to have a leg up on kind of your your peer your peer class that you're that you're there with. And uh, I I uh, my boss has has been trying to pull me out of accounting in a lot of ways because he just wants me to focus more on kind of that operations. But I think the only reason he wants me to do that is because I have that accounting background. So it just goes to show you that um, it's it's a really critical. Uh, critical um, skill set to have. And uh, um, I'm here to tell you that going, going, um, going outside of the public route is a, is, is a really good route as well, so. Thank you, appreciate that. I uh, just, a reminder, uh, I did not see that Dr. Hogue uh, put a, uh, uh, basically a reminder to, to everybody. If you have questions, feel free to post those questions in the chat and uh, we will save some time at the end, about 10 minutes or so. Uh, for in, for questions from participants. Uh, John, do you have anything you'd like to add as far as uh, starting out in public accounting or not starting out in public accounting? Uh, maybe a couple things that I just highlight uh, a couple things Riley said. One is he talked about um, talking with his siblings and other mentors that helped him, you know, kind of establish his own thoughts on which way he wanted to go. Um, and I guess I'd really... Um, really emphasize the importance of doing that. Um, you know, looking back to when I was getting done with college, you know, I was kind of the, the kid that didn't, didn't know what he wanted to do when he grew up, right? Um, but I had plenty of people around me that were, um, that knew me well enough and were doing a number of different things that helped my perspective um, on making that decision. So find those people, uh, whoever they are, you and, and, uh, you know, have as many cups of coffee with them as you can as you're making that decision. Um, the other thing I'd say, uh, Riley talked about getting into operations and, um, you know, the fact that uh, his boss might want him in operations because he's got that accounting perspective. And that's just 100% accurate based on my uh, most recent experience of, you know, I was owner and CFO of, we have some tree fruit companies here. And I mean, there was days, and I want to say there was probably weeks where I didn't touch the accounting, um, depending on which fire we were putting out that week, right? Um, but my partners, I know, really respected and appreciated the fact that I could go into the same situation they were, whether it was talking with the bank, talking with a potential purchase um, on the other side of a purchase transaction, you know, uh, wrestling with the state of Washington COVID restrictions, uh, you know, going in a, into those conversations with a, with an accounting perspective and a finance perspective and, and really can set you apart. So I'd, I'd emphasize those things from, from Riley's answer. Thank you. Appreciate that. Jake, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, the only thing I'd probably add is I completely agree with everybody that I don't think it's a mandatory route. I, having still been in with Deloitte, I know I realize the benefit to some of you can learn a lot, you can try a lot of different things, but the only thing I would add is it's not an either or, as Carly kind of hinted on. I have quite a few colleagues that either started at Deloitte, left, went to industry, have come back, went industry first, decided they wanted a career change, came into the big four so that they could retool, change specializations. And so, well, I completely agree. There's big pros and cons to whichever route you choose directly out of school all the time there's cross hiring between the big four, their clients, small companies, big companies. So I would never close off that door, even if you choose to cho to take one career path out of school as down the road, switching over from public to private may be beneficial. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's interesting because when I was back in the day, when I was in public accounting, it didn't happen like that as much. You went from public accounting and you went out, but you didn't usually come back. But so it's interesting to hear that 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 is happening to some degree. That there is some back and forth, and, and their opportunities are there. Appreciate 
appreciate all the comments there. I'm going to skip down to our last question. Um, it's not our last question of the of the um, of the afternoon, but the, the last question on our list because I want to make sure we cover it because it was one that I came up with. I don't know if it's a great question, but I, I think it's certainly relevant. And that is this: looking at the future, uh, how have the challenges of the past eighteen months affected accounting career opportunities and experiences? So thinking about the pandemic, basically. Anything that you're seeing or noticing as far as career opportunities in accounting changing in terms of what's out there or, or also how it's going to be experienced? Uh, let's see. Let's, uh, uh, Jake, let's go with you again since we just ended with you. Uh, yeah, um, I'll default to everybody else on the accounting specific piece, but we've just seen kind of the work workforce management model change a lot with the last 18 months and being remote. And I'd say we've seen a big shift in where at least I staff people, clients I get to work with and being that a lot of my role is remote. It's, and kind of tying this back to an accounting perspective, I think it's greatly changed opportunities. And so I used to be geographically bound to who I could pull onto my team or clients I could support at any given time. And that's completely changed, which I think, especially for analysts and younger members of the firm that I work with, it's given them exposure to a lot more work and a lot of different types of work that they might not have been able to jump into right away out of undergrad. So uh, again, I'll default to the rest of the panel on the accounting specific side, but holistically, I think it's created a lot more opportunity than pre moving remote enabled us to, to take advantage of. Thank you, John, would you like to add some of your comments to that? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, maybe some of the issues that both public accountants and then the other side of the fence that I've been on most recently within industry that the last 18 months have highlighted for me is that, um, you know, at least in the U.S., we're in this we're in this extremely mature economy, right? And now we're in an extremely mature economy that's under a bunch of stress from a whole lot of different uh, from a whole lot of different issues, and it seems like the only response to those is uh, increasing regulation, whether it's uh, tax or just name any set of regulations. Um, it, it just highlights to me the fact that, you know, if we thought there was job security and accounting before, it just gets uh, greater as the years go on. You know, Congress decides to simplify the tax code and it gets much more complicated than it was before they started. Um, you know, government program rollouts like PPP, idle loans, uh, employee retention credits, those have all kept public accounting firms and accountants with an industry incredibly busy over the last 18 months. Um, and they've worked to uh, a large degree by many standards. So um, I, I just feel like um, having the accounting background and, and the CPA license specifically is something that's going to set you up to where, to a certain extent, the business is going to come to you, as they say, rather than the other way around. That makes sense. Yes. Yes. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Carly, what do you think about the, the this last 18 months and how it's going to affect the future? Yeah, um, I was just nodding that whole time John was talking because I completely agree with everything that he just said. I've seen a ton of opportunity coming out of the last 18 months, um, you know, because there's very specific accounting implications that came with the pandemic. Um, you know, for in the world of banking, that's PPP loans and loan forgiveness. Um, a lot of companies have had to deal with impairments or, you know, rent expense um, implications from their employees not being in office. And so, like John said, you know, it really just points to the job security that you have in the accounting world. You're always going to need accounting for something, whether, you know, things in the economy are looking good, whether they're not looking so good. We basically always have um, you know, some sort of implication at hand that we all need to deal with. Thank you. Riley, anything you'd like to add to that question? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I can be brief too. I would just say generally and kind of objectively, I mean, there's, uh, there's a labor shortage of people who have, uh, you know, skilled positions. And I just think, uh, at least in the private industry and here locally in Spokane, I know there are a lot of people employers who are trying to fill roles uh, and particularly at that entry level position um, for kids right out of college that 
uh, just having a hard time even getting a pool of resumes together to, to interview. So, I mean, I think uh, you guys who are in college now, whether you're just as freshmen or even in your senior year, I mean, um, it's a unique place to really go out and sell yourself because I think there are a lot of people looking for, for qualified applicants and there's a really limited pool. Um, and so I would just say, you know, that that could be real, a real advantage for you um, as you look for your first job. Thank you. And we just, I think we just saw last week, uh, I think Dr. Hoke sent out an email, PwC is going completely virtually uh, online if you want to, um, which just blows my mind as a former public uh, CPA, thinking about the fact that uh, someone could basically do all their work um, pretty much at home uh, because of the of the changes we've seen last 18 months. That's a permanent change. Um, so very, very crazy amount of work that uh, or crazy amount of change in the last 18 months. Uh, and we expect, as, as mentioned by our panelists, that that's only going to impact in a positive way um, the accounting profession. And uh, there's just lots, lots of work to do out there. So appreciate the comments there. Again, please, if you have questions, uh, post those. We'll be getting to those in a few minutes. We still have a few more questions here. Um, I guess let's ask this question. Do you have any advice for students who are still considering whether uh, a career in accounting is right for them? I know we've heard some comments already about how versatile it is, it is but also you know, think about students who may or may not feel real comfortable with the material yet uh, or comfortable with um, their ability to learn the material. Do you have any advice for students who are considering accounting as a, as a career option? And uh, let's, let's start with uh, John. Yeah, so I guess um, if you're early on in your accounting education, and that's part of the reason you're on this call, I would say um, keep pursuing those those classes. Um, don't don't run to your don't run into your first roadblock in your first accounting class and and uh, throw up your hands and say I don't get it. Um, you know, there's a lot there's a whole lot I didn't get uh, right away. As I think Dr. Weber might be on this call and. And I was in class with with uh, Professor Brashitz and, and Dr. Hogue, so they can attest to that as well. Um, push through push through the barriers. You're going to find them. They're going to be in any career. Um, accounting gets a bad rap. Um, we're all supposed to be boring green visor wearing you know nerds that sit in the basement and get sunburned if we go outside. Um, that's just so not that's still not the reality of uh, so much of the world of accounting and, and finance. Um, so I guess I would say uh, two pieces of advice. One, push through, push through the barriers, whether they're your own or whether uh, you're challenged by the material. And uh, yeah, the, uh, we might be nerds, but it's actually a lot more fun than, than, uh, than, it's, uh, than it's cracked up to be. So. I appreciate that, John. When you were talking, I was thinking about my own experience. I don't think I ever completed successfully a cash flow statement uh, in my undergraduate degree, the indirect method. So it wasn't until I was out working for a while that I was able to finally figure that one out. So, you know, there you have it. It's 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 challenging at times. Uh, let's see, Jake. What are your thoughts to to share with students? Oops, on mute. Sorry, I don't have a whole lot more than what John had, but I would just say also you learn pretty quick when you get into the professional world that as extensive as accounting is and as hard as it can be at times, it doesn't cover 100% of what's out there and you will learn tons in real world applicable skills. And so I think it's true of pretty much every major that's out there, but even if you haven't found the specific thing, kind of like what Dr. Law was saying, maybe cash flow statements, there's a, there's a certain part that isn't for you. There's such a broad stroke base of accounting in every, and we, what we kind of started talking about, every single industry, every company has an accounting core. There's just no escaping it. And so if you don't find it necessarily in your undergrad career, uh, you, you might find that specialty that you like or something else post-grad. So as John said, I wouldn't give up on it yet. And as most of us have already said, it's so versatile that you can take it anywhere. So I highly recommend it. Accounting, I think, is just a solid foundation in anything that you do. Thank you. Appreciate that. Carly. 
Yeah, I agree with what John and Jake both said. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you if you like accounting and you're maybe feeling like you're not fully grasping the concepts, I think we've all kind of touched on the point that, you know, the learning curve is very steep when you start your career. So, you know, especially in public accounting, because that's where I started. And so I saw a lot of people start after me. Um, we did not expect people to know everything or honestly very much at all. <laughs> when they started, we would tell our staff, you know, you're not expected to know how this works. Um, you're going to learn how this works. So um, I think just echoing what everyone has already said that, you know, you don't need to stop there um, or think that that's how it's going to be forever. You'll definitely learn it the more experience you get with it. Riley, do you have anything you'd like to add? Any advice to students? Yeah, I, I would say the best thing that you guys can do, especially if you're kind of on the fence, if accounting is right for you, is, uh, I mean, do exactly what you guys are doing. You're on this call and you're listening to other people talk about what they do and where they where they went with their accounting degree. Um, I would say your professors are a really good starting point. They're, um, they're there to help you and they also have a really good network of people. And just the more that you can reach out to other people who are in accounting, um, everybody was, that's in accounting was in your shoes at one point. And uh, it's, it's no question that Zags help Zags. And I think uh, if you reached out to really anybody, um, whether even it's just a kind of a cold, cold message on LinkedIn, uh, I think people, people like talking about what they're doing and where they went. And uh, the more exposure you can get to kind of how big and broad that career path can be in accounting, I think the more attractive it becomes to you. Um, so I would just, I would just not, uh, hesitate to just reach out and talk to as many people as you can. Um, and just that'll paint a pretty good picture of the opportunity out there. So we're, we're always, uh, we're always willing to, to just sit down and, and engage you and answer any questions. So use that to your advantage. Excellent. That's true. I mean, we've got a great alumni network of folks who love to visit with students and, and answer questions about their careers. And, and so you know, take advantage of that. Uh, there is a question. Um, it looks like we've got a couple of questions from folks from Adam. Um, his question is, are there any specific majors or minors that assist accounting well? I know that Dr. Hogue talked a little bit about IT, but let's, let's open it up to the panel. Um, any particular majors or minors that go really well with accounting? Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna let whoever would like to speak first just unmute and go from the panel. I think Jacob, I think you were gonna go, or Riley, there you go. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I can start, I mean, I, I think, uh, I mean, part of the requirement to get your CPA is, is you gotta have 150 earned credits. So I'm the type of guy who uh, definitely want that, that college experience and that nice balance of school and fun. And you can do that by just taking other classes. So, I mean, I, I would encourage you to, um, the finance route is really good. I was, uh, I did finance as well when I was at Gonzaga. And uh, I just think there's a lot of translation in the finance world with accounting. I mean, they go hand in hand. Uh, finance in a lot of senses is more broad, um, but you're, there's a lot of finance language carryover. Um, so I, I think that's a really good route to, to supplement your accounting and then you get those credits and you can, you can work towards 150 a lot faster. So, so finance, we've heard, um, IT, other, other majors or minors that go well with accounting? This is probably a little bit too general, but I, I, I guess I would just emphasize that I think a passion for anything wrapped in accounting knowledge is just going to be super powerful for you. Um, so, you know, are there, are there complementary majors? Yeah. I, my, my initial reaction was going to be finance. I think if anyone can understand, you know, basic finance concepts, um, whether you're an accountant or not, it, it's, I would suggest finance to any major as a minor at least, but, um, you know, if you've got a passion for something and, um, you know, like, uh, like Riley said, it's, uh, you know, you got to get 150 hours. Um, you know, there's nothing that says you have to do accounting with a minor in MIS or finance. Um, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of guardrails around that conversation necessarily from my perspective. 
Thank you. Excellent. We have this maybe our last question, uh, and I think it's a good one. Certainly, it's one that I'm interested in. Um, how are things like job satisfaction, work-life balance, and burnout? And of course, many of these panelists know that my dissertation was on public accounting burnout. I still research burnout. So this is a question that I, I often pose. So let's hear from the panelists. How, how are those things? How, how's that, how does that work for you guys? Or how has it worked? Uh, let's start with Jake. This one is near and dear to my heart being that I'm still in the industry, but it's just something I'm glad this question was asked because this is something I forgot to address when we were talking about how the landscape has changed over the last 18 months. Because in public accounting and just in the big four, there's been exceptionally high turnover over the last 18 months. And I, I don't like to sugarcoat things that I went into the big four knowing this, but you work a lot. And I think that's part of the selling points of when you work a lot, you get a lot of client exposure, there's, there's value in that. But then as a result, there is high burnout. Um, and as Dr. Wall said, it's really common for do a few years in public accounting and then we even go do something else. And work-life balance is a big driver of that pattern. But one of the things I am excited for is as a result of adjusting to, as we heard PwC going remote, I think the firms are making a very conscious effort to fix some of the work-life burnout issues that has been just standard practice in the industry thus far. And so at least at the way we're doing a lot in terms of remote working and consulting side, I travel Monday through Thursday every week, and they're starting to give more flexibility into not having to get on a plane every week of the, of the year. And um, we're still, we're focusing a lot on um, kind of, I, can, I can't remember off the top of my head what the initiative is, but it's looking at how can we stay competitive with talent and not lose talent as quickly? And so to more succinctly answer your question, I, I think there is a struggle in public accounting with work-life balance, but I'm excited to see that as it seems like every industry has been impacted by COVID and, and the remote lifestyle, I actually think the big four and, and accounting maybe as a whole will change for the better as a result. Thank you. Appreciate that. Carly, would you like to comment? Yeah, um, so I agree with what Jake said, um, but I was actually still in public accounting um, when the pandemic started and um, I felt like, you know, for me and my teams, we actually had some more burnout that occurred after we started working virtually just because, you know, your computer's sitting at your house and it's easy to have it in the kitchen with you while you're making dinner versus like before we would have logged off and gone home to make dinner or, you know, something like that. So. Um, you know, and in, in industry too, now that I'm in industry, um, or private in the private sector, um, we still get busy. We still have deadlines and we still work a lot sometimes. Um, it's just maybe different times of the year, um, or different cadences. Um, but I think that one of the biggest things that I learned from the burnout that occurred working remotely is just you need to learn how to set boundaries for yourself. So talking to your team members and saying, hey, you know, I, my family always does family dinner at this time every day. So I'm going to be logged off at this time every day, but I'll come back if I have something that I didn't finish or I'll finish it, you know, earlier tomorrow morning than I normally would or something like that. Like setting those boundaries is going to help so much with burnout versus just being on all the time or being on your phone because we all have you know, Microsoft Teams on our phones and our emails on our phones. And so it's really easy to just pull it up at any time. Um, so being an advocate for yourself is going to be huge. Agreed. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, John, do you want to take a minute? Yeah, I was going to say something very similar to what Carly's just expressed. And that's kind of, I think, I think the responsibility of, to fight burnout, so to speak, starts with every individual, right? Um, everybody's going to have different personal ideas on what their work should look like. And I think you have to ask yourself, you know, uh, you have repeatedly have to ask yourself whether or not your balance is where it should be. Um, if you get into public accounting or if you get an industry right out of school, I can tell you that, um, you know, 40 hour weeks are really great in theory. Um, you're probably going to work a lot. Um, you're, there's somebody that'll find, you know, your 40 hour week job straight out of school and it's going to be everything you want and you'll still learn everything you want. And 
my personal opinion, it might not be super popular is I saw the first few years of my career is, well, I can work really hard and learn at a, you know, 150% rate compared to some other folks. And um, I had the opportunity to do that luckily, um, but I don't regret doing that. So um, that being said, uh, you know, jumping out of public accounting for the last seven years before recently getting back in, I just took my family on our first full week vacation in seven years about a month ago. So uh, the outside of public accounting dynamic is going to be just the same as inside. It's it's going to be up to you guys to to make it uh, balance with with what you think it should be. Thank you, Riley. We got about thirty seconds. Do you want to just add your last thoughts? Great. Yeah, I'll uh, touch just kind of briefly on what John just said. I do think uh, when you're graduating college and you're heading into your first job, you are at a really unique opportunity in your life to where it's your first job and you're being exposed to a lot of things for the very first time. And so as much as you can front load uh, that experience and that knowledge and kind of put that 150% in, it's just going to do you wonders later on down in your career. You can almost think of it as like uh, making an investment in something. I mean, the more quickly you can get that interest compounding, the bigger your asset base is going to build. And it's just like that with your kind of your mind and your work ethic as well. I mean, the more you can get out there on a really hot start and just get those wheels really turning, um, you'll find that the more down, down the road, you can, you can, uh, I guess, kind of let your foot off the gas and just go with what you've really got working for you already. So I would say, take advantage of that first job, that first two years in your job is going to be a really, really unique opportunity that you'll never have again in your life to just really set set the base for uh what what the rest of your career looks like so get that interest compound in early awesome well i want to just take a second and thank all of our panelists for being with us today and their busy schedule and sharing with uh, us their thoughts and and experiences uh, in accounting in the different areas of accounting they worked on and thank everyone who's participated in either ask, asking questions or just been here to listen in. I, this is being recorded, so it'll be available. Once again, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Just to give everybody, a, give our panelists a little bit of a, uh, a clap, uh, a round of applause for all the time that they've given us today. That would be awesome. Thank you again.